uh, as you all know, I mean, you all uh, scholars in the economics, Lambert has become very important since time and screen. After uh, a book, a London book of Hernando de Soto, of course, it was around before, but it became in the limelight, a uh, uh, focus of attention after a book published by Hernando de Soto. And it's called The Mystery of Capital. And that book focuses on land rights and property rights at large. It's a book, uh, you all have that or should have that. Yeah? And if, you, if you didn't, please do. Yeah? And basically what he, what he talks about in that book is how uh, property rights and land rights turn an asset into capital. And he frames it as assets are that capital, he can't be using, and property rights turn that capital into life capital something economically valuable. Yeah. In that book, uh, he refers about, well, the first thing to understand is there's no such thing as universal property rights. It's, you could think of it as a continuum. If you think about land rights in specific, you go from very informal land rights to completely formalized land rights as you have in Western Europe. And in between, you have all kinds of mixed approaches. It could be a customary approach, you could have uh, occupancy, Squatters, people that occupy territory but have no legal rights, so they have control but no rights. You could have group tenure rights, you could have leases, perpetual leases like in the Soviet Union, long term leases. Uh, you could have all kinds of stuff. And the idea of this lecture is look at how these things work and why they are important. Okay. Uh, so, what, what Hernando de Soto said in his, uh, in his book essentially is okay, why are some companies successful, some not? And of course, it has been said by many other economists that if you think of the whole uh, extract institutions that for our civil movement is also largely by property rights and how they are protected. So he's not the first to say this. But he basically in that book said, okay, why are some countries doing so much better than others? They call the emerging market economies, they call the transition economies. One reason is probably these property rights, and especially land rights. Yeah? So this is uh, straight from his book. Huh? So to, to make it clear, what I mean by example, uh, if I'm in some transition country, before the institution of property rights, for land rights, like in Russia, land rights in Russia were only installed in the 2000s. On agricultural land in 2004. So there were no land rights, and that created all kinds of problems. So basically, if it's that capital, because in those countries, the assets, you can control them, but you don't really own them. So you can only use them for what they are used. So if, for example, imagine you're, you're on top of agricultural land and you control it. That means you can work it. You can harvest it. But you can't sell it. You can't use it as collateral to get credit. That is a lot. Impossible. So it's that capital, not life capital. And in uh, the West, people, uh, I think also about house homes. And, and initially, people didn't have their homes. And in the early 90s, many homes were privatized. People got their homes, uh, uh, but some, in some cases, yes, some cases, no, in very different ways. But if you have a home, you can use it as a way to get credit. If you have a business idea, you can take a mortgage on your home. And, uh, and uh, in the US, you can even use the home to consume. You can use your home as like a way to get extra cash uh, by getting mortgage. So basically, it means that something that is a debt asset becomes something uh, alive. That's the whole idea. He puts some numbers on it in his book. Uh, so he refers to a number of countries. There's many more than two countries. I'll just pick a few examples. Of course, these are the numbers from his book. So these are many three numbers. So I'm going to go back to his book, essentially. And he says, look, already then, the, the numbers are staggering. And, and it's both in urban environments, big uh, swaths of land and um, of industrial companies and of people. Houses. But also rural lands, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in uh, emerging market economies, a lot of the lands people control, but they cannot sell or, or uh, pledge as for credit. Uh, so you see, very large parts of the population in these countries have no real property rights. They at best have some, some kind of control rights, some kind of informal control rights. Um, he also looked in his book at how difficult is it. So many countries, in all these countries, the official system exists, but most of the population does not use it. So that's kind of the puzzle. And then uh, in his book, he basically, and now there's a big literature uh, that goes further on this, uh, with uh, Schleifer and others, that uh, looks at, okay, how difficult is it to use the official judicial system to get property rights? 
How many actual steps, so this is built on tactical theory, how many actual steps you have to do to establish a title and have the full rights? And this is the number of steps. So I mean, in some countries it's really extraordinary that. So this means you have a system, but the system doesn't work because it's too complex, too many steps you have to do. It's just uh, inefficient. Okay. So this is an example of a, a village in an African uh, country uh, where they have customary rights. So the, these are uh, little huts in the, in the village and they are majority owned by people from the village. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. This is also a beautiful example. So for example, this lady is carrying wood, but the wood she has collected from the uh, from the from the land, basically. But she has kind of custom right to do that. But it's not really officialized, and nobody really, really knows how that works. So then you get common resource problems, people cut too much wood, you get uh, uh, problems with all, all, all kinds. Uh, another example, and maybe one of the best examples, is uh, slums of favelas, or you can call them as you want, bidonvilles in French. So these are like big millions of people, this is Nairobi, live in these places around all the official cities. Often on land they don't own. This is like off land, maybe owned by the state, maybe owned by a big owner who doesn't touch it, and people squat on it. They just go sit there, start building houses, start building roads, start building their own systems. But of course it's very inefficient. So the problem is you have to control it. You can live there, you have some shelter, but you have no certainty. What if someone the next day takes it away from you? What can you do? Nothing. Don't, don't even this fight and make sure you have people around that are protected. But you cannot go to the judge. You have nothing on paper. You have no right to be there. Uh, could you sell the house? So imagine that's what you want to move. It's very hard to sell it. Because you have no title. So one person can never be certain you, you're actually the, the one who is entitled to sell it. Uh, can you use it to that credit? No. I mean, a very big part of the population will live in these kind of places. And it deprives them of many economic possibilities. Uh, this is another example from Vietnam. Huh? Uh, so basically, one, one thing you can see right away is a lot of uh, dirt here, basically because there are no amenities. There's no water collection, usually. There's no water distribution, usually. There's no electricity in many cases, so then the rest. Huh? And that creates all kinds of problems. And people go there because it's cheap, it's for free. But at the same time, you have no rights. And there have been many attempts around the world to address this problem right? and to give people what actually uh, economic rights. Uh, this is another example from uh, Cape Town. And you see here, there they call them shanty towns. But every, every country seems, seems to have their own name. So this is the shanty town of the uh, uh, local settlement. Yeah? Uh, and okay, so this is the official part of the city. And then this is the squad part of the city. And I'll show you a picture just to make the point. The, the point is if you are living here, you never know. For all you know, the next day, someone decides, okay, we should build here a new neighborhood and we're going to bulldoze or everything away. It could just happen. It happened in Zimbabwe at a massive scale. And look at this place. Try to uh, visually uh, remember this place. This is uh, actually a sports uh, facility. Uh, and then this line. Look what happens. This is the thing. It's gone. That's exactly what they did. They didn't use civil supplements. People were living there. And just, at some point, someone says, okay, we have to give up and just build up. Change your name. So all the investment is all gone. This is the problem. You have no assurance. So you will never really invest in these homes. You will make them go by, but they will never be really be good homes. Why would you? Really invest in a better roof that doesn't leak if the next day you could build those again. Why would you invest in better walls and isolation to make sure your kids don't get sick if the next day they could take it away? So, no assurance. You, you, uh, uh, you can never get a credit based on this because the bank knows that this is a problem. So, the bank knows, I mean, if things go wrong, I will never be able to sell them. If I can sell it, I mean, they could build those or they could take it away again. So, this is a very big problem. If this is all this stuff, this is life capital, this is death capital. Not because they're bad, because they have no rights. This is the thing. Okay? So let's talk about property. What is property? 
And from the property, I mean, the property is, is uh, uh, probably is millennia old, but the modern property right, the way we understand it, not only as a title, but as a full legal system of connections and switches, is not so old actually. In the modern sense, I would say, not more than 200 years old, and a few countries probably a bit older. Uh, and it's been widespread in the West in the last 100 years. Even in Flanders, until the last century, in all communities, in all local villages, large parts of the agricultural network comes. And it's only very late in the very Western European countries that the comments have disappeared and have not been largely privatized. So the idea that uh, former property is the, like the default is actually a bit of a new idea in any country. Uh, so in Japan, it's anyway less than 50 years old. So, and, and what I want to convey to you is that this is an invisible institution. <coughs> so we are like all fish in the water, but we don't move in the water. We do our economic transactions, our activities, in the surroundings of, we assume the property rights exist, and the whole system exists. That makes everything very easy. It allows you to sell some assets, it allows you to buy stock, to buy properties, it allows you to have a home, all these things, but they are only possible because of this institutional framework of property rights that surrounds us. We don't see it, we, we look through it. But it's only like fish if you jump out of the water on the land and say, oh God, I missed the water, but I could never saw it, right? So it's something, so I think it's still under terrorized, although there's a lot of, in the last 20 years, there's a massive amount of theory on property rights, of course, but still it's not fully understood by many students in economics. Most Students in economics don't get into student economics at all, unfortunately, and they never think about the idea of property rights. They assume it. And I think that I think everyone should have institutional economics, but even at my own university, there's a big fight to get it in the, the, the default program, and it's still been that. So I think that's a shame. But okay, I'm in the past, probably. Yeah. Um, so it's a concept, and in a way, what, what, what property rights do is it moves assets, things from the realm of physical stuff to the realm of mental, mental concept. Property rights are a mental state. It's allocating, so basically think of your bank account. What is a bank account? What is money? It's just a, a system of bits and bytes nowadays. The only thing it does is it allocates entitlements. It gives you rights and consumption in the future in a very Abstract way. Our property rights are the same. It's, it's something in the mental space. It's a system uh, that is uh, very complex to very complex to basically explain. I want to stress to you, it's not the same as titles. Many people confuse titles for property rights. It's not the same. It's not because you get a title on your house or your land or the company the company you own the stock that you have a property right. It's a very different thing. To have property rights, you need also ledgers. You need a system. That's why the whole Bitcoin revolution, you say, is so important. Huh? You need like so it's a ledger. It's a whole system uh, where the title assets become more protected. Why? Because you can build contracts around them. You can build legal instruments around them. You can, with these contracts and legal instruments, you can connect to governments. You can connect to private companies. So basically, the title only becomes an, an asset if, if, if you can act upon it, if you can write a contract on it. A collateral contract, a sale contract, a, something else. I mean, the ability could be there, the ability you could have usufruct. So many guns have usufruct rights. <laughs> usufruct is you entitled to use <coughs> the assets. You have the income from the assets, but not like a property, you can't sell the property. Someone else owns it, but you can use it. So you can, the property you can split in many different parts, you can trade it separately, you can use, you can sell some of the user for the property, like the property not the other way around. So it's a really complex system actually, once you start looking at it, that uh, kind of uh, allocates rights on assets and allows you to relate with the governments uh, for all kinds of reasons and for private businesses. Let me give you a few examples. Tanzania, this is like, this is very old. So property rights over animals are uh, kind of established by burning a sign to the ground. But that's not that's not a property right, that's a title. It's a title. You have the same, this is the, the city of the dead, it's the, the shanty town in uh, Cairo. This is actually uh, the sort of 
when you can see that. So in many of these shanty towns, on top of the building, you have a, a writing. It's, it's written there. This is this and this building, it's here, here, and it belongs to this and this person. This is not a problem. It's a title. It just says it's my and it's mine. But it doesn't mean you can use it to get a credit or to pay taxes. But that you can sell it immediately. So many people establish titles, but the titles is not yet a property right. No system around it also needs to be there. We have a mining exception in Peru, we have uh, some types in Haiti, uh, this is even Afghanistan. Huh? So any so that, that exists for this kind of stuff, titles exist for centuries, for millennia from the property rights don't. They are much younger. The idea of property is much broader and much younger than titles. So that's something I want to keep. Many people confuse that. Even in social economies, the titles are not property rights. Uh, they are necessary, but not sufficient. The, for property rights, you need titles, but you need more than that. You need a whole system around it. Uh, the titles alone are still that kind. Titles alone are still that kind. You need them, but you need something else. Okay, so how do we do that? The first thing is we need titles, alright? Uh, titles is uh, usually something like this. Actually, in Belgium, it's been digitized only for. 10 years, but 10 years ago when I bought uh, my house, it's still like this. And you get this title and you have some so copy like this. So there's somewhere a description of every parcel. So this is a number on a map, this is the area, uh, and this is down the circumscription, number of parcels. And then you have actual maps, where this is actual map with an actual street, where you have all these little numbers, it's all measured uh, geographically. And then uh, with boundaries and uh, what other blocks to whom. And then you have, and that's the most important part, the ledger. And the ledger writes down all the transactions. In the ledger, you have, okay, someone pledged this land to this person, it's pledged uh, for the second, and second order to that person, you can pledge the same asset two or three times. And some seniority. Many people do that actually. And many companies do that. And you do a little look into company credits. Many companies pledge your asset two, three times, so to different banks and different seniority orders to secure credits. If you sell it, it's written in the ledger, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you see more and more of these ledgers start to develop. They can take very different forms. This is the Miami Miyakiti ledger in Tanzania. There are tens of thousands of them. We have some, some uh, in Peru. Yeah? This is very localized. Uh, in a way, the security exchange commission drafts is also just a ledger in a sense. Yeah? Um, but you also have uh, business candidates in ISIS. A big part of criminal activity and even of terrorism is they provide property rights. The system does not provide. So, one reason I believe uh, terrorist organizations and criminal activities are supported by the local population is because these guys provide property rights. Not well, just but property rights. They also enforce them and they make sure you can get credit from them. So, and, and this is a lot of others. This happened actually uh, also with ISIS and uh, uh, in other places. Uh, so there's a big link with illegal and criminal organizations in countries that do not provide property rights and not provide, and have definitely not their enforcement. So we could say in countries with extractive institutions or deficient institutions. You see that in many cases it's picked up, the slack is picked up by criminal organizations or by even terrorist groups. Uh, I mean, there's a, a lot of literature on, for example, the mafia in Sicily. It looks at the, uh, the origins of the mafia in Sicily and relates this to uh, this kind of problems. Deficient property rights, and all of this is like a resource room, or maybe oranges or lemons, or call it sulfur, uh, and then the mafia jumps into the, the gap and they start to provide the enforcement needed to the ministry and, and they rise as an institution. But it's the absence of a functioning system that leads to their uh, emergence, basically. So basically, providing this is a great way of soliciting public support. If you want people to support you, give them property rights. Protect the property rights. Uh, so these are our examples. This is an ISIS title in Syria, Iraq. This is actually uh, from a presentation from the Soto, who sent to me. Um, this is uh, rent control in uh, Iraq. So even rent control, making sure people don't have to pay for natural houses. An Al Qaeda title. Uh, you could also have the FARC in Colombia. You have the Shining Park in Peru. 
all of these guys, what they do in the place they sit, they immediately start to make cadastres and ledgers and allocate people on top of that and enforce them. So people can sell it, people can even get credits in some form. So institutions matter, property rights matter. If you don't provide them, someone will. And usually not for the better, not for the greatest society. So we should not underestimate their progressive power. Uh, some people even argue that why would the Arab Spring? This is, of course, a far from complete explanation, right? It's a partial explanation, definitely. But some people say the Arab Spring was definitely linked to property rights and to land rights. Uh, this is, we all know, of course, the story of the sad story of Mr. Bouazizi, but he was not the only one. Many people committed suicide in some form or other in the Arab Spring. Yeah? And in the press, it was about the police basically captured. Is uh, why well, he was selling fruits, right? The vegetables on the street, and the police kind of captured his thing. But if you look deeper, you, you see that he was. This is the place where he was living. This this spot, and this is the spot where property rights were kind of lost, uh, not very well protected, and see my form. And what you see, he had a collection of titles, property rights, like a official official government title that he was allowed to stay in, although there was no official property rights, like a squatting right. And then this actually, if you zoom in, you will have nine of these rights here. What happened to the family is they, they, they were expropriated. So in the region they lived, they were pushed out, somebody else was put in, a lot connected person. And that's the real drama for some people still. So this is was just the last drive. But he was completely disenfranchised. He had no assurance. He only had control rights. But he couldn't go to the judge. It was all like see my form here. And that's the frustration with people. And that's what drives their argument. Right? Uh, in fact, if you go to all the people that did self domination or suicides uh, in the Arab Spring, all of them are actually. So, so people said, people in the press often because these people are well employed, they have no jobs, they have total frustration with their unemployment and their economic situation. If you look at them, all of them are entrepreneurs. They're all entrepreneurs. So all these guys are actually frustrated with the institutional framework. They were not people without. Potential. There were people who were doing relatively well in their environments. And they, they, they felt screwed by the system to put it like this. And that's why they became so angry. So, just to stress how important and pervasive property rights can be, and we don't see it because we have them. They did not have them, and they, they saw it. They saw it. It's a big thing. Okay. So, so why then do land rights fuel investment and development? There's many, 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 many channels, but I'm just going to list the three most important ones. And on all these channels, there's a lot of literature papers. So you see, I did not cite all the papers because I can, I mean, I can do that, but I just want to tell you the story. Um, the one is the assurance effect. If I'm certain that I will be protected against expropriation, I gave you a few examples already, I will invest more because I can keep the receipts. It's very simple. The second one is the collateralizability effect or the DeSoto effect. This is the point the sort of made as the first, not the first, but the, the first in an important way that was picked up by the profession. Uh, and that's the idea, if you have an asset that is a property right, you can pledge it. It becomes collateral. So if there is finance around you, that's a good condition actually, you can uh, get credit and invest. And third is a realizability effect. You can sell that asset. You could use the capital and do something else. There's actually a big paper on Mexico that shows how Mexico, not more than 10 years ago, installed property rights on communal land rights. Now the big effect was that some people sell, sold the land, not in the city and started the business, and the remaining guys consolidated the land. The farmers became bigger and much more productive. So one bigger way that property rights work is also creating mobility. Because if you have no property right, you are tied to the land. You, you are like, to see my own my land on the play, right? It's gone. Because you only control it, you don't sell it. So it also creates mobility of God and people. Right? So these are the, the three big challenges, I think. Um, this, uh, I want you to give it, so okay, about timing, I never I never keep my timing, so you have to stop me at some point. Right? That's, yeah. So that's uh, just a warning. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk about this paper, why? Because he was here in one of uh, one of the RCCs. Uh, so Sebastian, uh, this guy, was, was here actually. And I was presenting him my paper. So I also do research on property rights. 
and he really the trash magnet for pity. It doesn't have every game battery and it's not the best thing to have one There's also an example for you. Be happy to be trashed. I was trashed here, presenting my stuff like a big guy. It became a much better game and it's important. So that's why to honor that, I want to talk about his favorite also. And then we'll talk about mine. Um, so that's him. That's, uh, that's Sebastian. Uh, who was an RCC? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what did he talk about? He talked about the idea of land rights in an urban uh, environment. And he looks at another experiment in Buenos Aires. So you have this little uh, thing here, uh, this place put in red here. And what is it? It's a shanty town, you could call it. Uh, they call it favela uh, in, in Latin America. Favela uh, in Buenos Aires. And what happened in the early 90s, there were a number of families that just squatted on land that nobody used, it was laying you know, bare, and they, they squatted without having the property. Yeah? Uh, and so the interesting thing was they believed it was belonging to the government. So they thought they were safe. But actually it belonged to a few big private uh, families. It was private on that, not on the moment. And then the government in the in the wise moment they passed a law and they said, okay, we will compensate these owners that we accept or reject and we'll offer the people in Savas free property rights. So that was actually amazing. So without pain, basically pretty much as happened uh, in Russia, after the fall of Soviet Union, people got their quartinas, apartments and flats. People got basically their homes and the land rights. Uh, and so this is nice because some people got it and some people didn't. Because some of the owners didn't want to sell. They, they, they said to the government, I don't want the compensation, it's my land, people should leave. And one said, okay, we'll go, I will do it. Then I got some money and the problem is over. So you have living next to each other. Some people are on that get a prop a land right, and some that don't. And you can compare it to that. That's the idea of the game. It's a very simple. So that, that's, that's identification. Yeah? What is the identification? Identical people treated differently. One gets a land right, one doesn't. There's a treating group, does not get it. This is a control group that doesn't get one. It's not like that. That's something not due to uh, themselves. So this is it. The government offers some compensation to the owners. Some guys refuse. Five. Those people living on their hands don't get the land right. Some guys accept. And uh, those people that have to live on that spot and they didn't know, they get the land right. They can compare those. So what are the results? Then look at the paper, results, a result on housing investment. Once you get a short, that's the insurance effect, right? Once you get your house, will you invest more in the house? Because you An effect on household structure, that's also an insurance effect. One of the big things is this, if you live in a favela, many people live in the same place. Why? Because your main problem is protection. Always some mafiosi or some uh, duck heads who basically come and take your property. And the only way to protect this is always have something in the home, have someone in the home, and have a big cloth that can put on fire if you need. So if, if once you have a title and you, nobody can take it away, what you expect is that the household structure will change. You will not have all your uncles and nephews living with you, but it's a few family, which you don't need protection. It's an assurance effect. You have to have effects on education, and you have effects on access to credit. That's uh, basically the result of that. And actually, labor earnings is also a, 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 like an additional result of that. <laughs> so this is, a, this is it. She got a property right. He didn't. Real pictures. Um, so when I say this, she's happy. So what are the differences? This guy has no door. So he have, has these things hanging, like, you know. Uh, she had built an addition. She has a really good like, gate here, and he has like located the problem. Uh, the window, this one, the window is barred, this one is not. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the wall is actually painted trash. This wall was, has been painted in the last uh, century. Had not been painted since the early 80s. <laughs> so so you, you see the visual. And if you go inside, actually this roof is a lot better insulated than this one. So here the kids will get sicker. They won't go to school because they're sick. They have all these effects. So, so what do they find uh, in terms of household size? So basically, they do, I did not go to explain all the economics, read the paper for yourself. But uh, 
you look at the number of halves of nuggets goes down. And especially, it's not the offspring, you have as much children as before compared to the other guys. But it's the other one of us. It's like this, you need all these people around you to protect your So let's be a little bit out. Which makes it, of course, also better in other ways. If you are a kid that needs to study, but not everybody lives in the house all the time, it's probably a better environment also. So you see also that there's an effect on school performance. School absenteeism fell, actually it fell on average, and it fell toward both two ways of practices. It fell from the two ways. Because if you live in a better house, with a better roof, and better insect, you can be less sick. So you will go to school more. And if you go to school more often, since you're sick, you also will do better at school. So a big effect was on through the better housing and two smaller families was on the children. And in the future, the longer in the fact you don't know, but if your children are better educated and less sick, of course it means that the future benefits too. The, the main thing they were thinking they would get is this one. Let's have four proteins that they would use lattice collateral, they would get eggs to collect more, and they will invest. And so you have more labor income. They will start businesses and they will invest in the capital and, and all this stuff. Also, since you don't need to leave, uh, I mean, you, you don't need any adults in the house to protect you, more people can work. So, the, the one channel is through investment, another channel is to, I don't have to stay at home to protect the house. More people can work in the household. So, both things would increase your income. Did that happen? No. No. No result of that. Uh, and the reason was, you can only, only accept this to happen if actually in this favela, there's a bank. The whole idea of this sort of creating real property rights, and they will work also not only through insurance, but also through collateral, it didn't work because there was no bank in the world. And also, they said initially, in the initial contract, they say, okay, you get a house, but you can't sell it the first 10 years. Uh, yeah, no realizability effect, you can't sell it, you can move. And you can't use it as collateral, even if there would have been a bank, actually. Because the bank would, would only accept the collateral if they can sell the house. And if you can't, then you get it. So these effects are just not there. Okay. Which brings me to my own issue. So basically, I thought after uh, I heard Sebastian, okay, so the problem is to some extent, you need both. You need a land right, and you need money back. And you need them to occur at the same time. The problem is, you can't test the stuff because they usually co evolve. Usually, in some countries, if you look at some countries, banking kind of originates and property rights originates, and they originate at the same time or less. So, you could never talk about causality. You could never show it's thanks to the land rights that we get this kind of development. Because you don't know that. You don't know. So, so, that's why I started thinking what could we do? And I thought of two examples. Actually, I'm working on a third one right now. With, uh, it's, it's, I'm not going to talk about this one, it's unfinished. But uh, there's two, two things I talk about. The first one is Flanders. Flanders is very nice today. Right? Because it's the second, Belgium and Flanders were the second country in the world to industrialize. Before Germany and Flanders were there, really more industrialization went back to the UK. Railways very early on, industrialization of textiles very early on. And the question is why? Why do why you industrialize so quickly? Uh, and my answer is, it's government, to some extent, and banking. Um, okay. All right, uh, this is the first question, actually. Okay. Okay, I fucked up. So, um, I'm gonna first going to talk about Russia. <laughs> this, is, this is the problem of the late at night slides. So, the second example, <laughs> but not the first one, is Russia. Uh, so, this one, is, uh, this one is the one I presented here, actually, and that was twice by Stilias, and I got a lot better on those papers. And the idea of Russia, is the following. Okay. The Soto actually came to this is Soto and he came to visit President Putin, explaining him you have to get people land rights on the Rajas and the industrial land rights. And Putin did it actually, right? So one of the, the things Putin did right is when he came to power, he installed property rights on land, both industrial land and rural land. And we tend to forget it, but this is still doing its magic today. Uh, so what is the hypothesis? Okay, there's two possible effects, right, of creating land rights. And why, okay, why is Russia interesting? I didn't say that yet. It's interesting because of the following reason. By the 2000s, when they installed land rights, they already had a banking system. 
That game was installed in the late 80s, was a big mess until 94, but by 1998, uh, things were clearing up. And by the 2000s, they had a relatively efficient balance system. I mean, a relatively efficient. But industrial firms couldn't get the logo. So they had plans, but no land rights. And the odd ones, there's this guy, he would just sort of okay, let's do land rights. So you get like a, a land rights, not a actually. Odd ones, they introduce land rights, four months in a place where there isn't any bond with it. Right? So that's what, that's what we did. Why is Russia also interesting? Look, a lot of the industrial land is inside cities, so in normal cities around the world. And the city cars, we have no industry. It's used for living, it's residential. But Soviet cities were different for defense reasons. It was full of additional capacity in the city heart. You still see that today. So all the red, red parts, St. Petersburg, are big industrial complexes in the city heart. If you look around the world, these are Russian cities. And this is the percentage of land in the city that is industrial. And it's really big compared to Eastern Europe or compared, compared to the rest of the world. So this is share of industrial land in the city heart in percentages. This was uh, in, nine, in 1992. Of course, it's changing. It's changing because of the reforms. Uh, it is changing, of course. Yes. But that's why it was interesting. We had the whole transition to do. Uh, and this was a big challenge, actually. How do you kind of deal with that? This collateral matter, there's a lot of um, you could say anecdotal evidence that the Russian collateral was a big problem in the 90s. And you have uh, Bloomberg and the Moscow Times at some point, I mean, this is like funny stories, right? But it was in uh, Bloomberg, so it's not so funny that at some point Western banks got us collateral pigs and lingerie because there was no land. You know, there were no real assets you could pledge. People could almost pledge everything in the beginning. Uh, and the, but the preferred form was the very early on real estate. So this is just showing, uh, this is the, the ledger. This is data from the Russian ledger in uh, 1998, actually 1999. And it shows you, by uh, province, and it's, I, it's obvious, right? So by Russian province, uh, it shows you, or region, yeah? it shows you what share of the uh, land inside the cities in this region is uh, Privately owned. So it's based the privately owned land divided by the state and municipality, C0. And, you, and, if, and if you look at the, the best region, it's only 25%. So, so in most, most model cities, it would be a lot more, actually. So this, this means by 98, still, um, and so today, a lot of the land in cities is actually owned by the government, but less and less. This is just a uh, this is, okay, this is three columns, they're all the same. This is just for the regions we have uh, of, of this number. Okay, what did we do? Uh, we basically did a big survey. We went to 500 big state farms that were privatized. And we asked them all kinds of questions about their land, how they got their land, how they got their land. Also about their uh, problems of getting access to credit, and also about their investment. So basically what we were doing essentially is trying to assess whether companies, industrial companies, indeed bought their land with the intention to get extra credit and whether it succeeded. So basically this is the sort of thing, right? So you, you, you introduce land rights at some point, you already have banking, and the question is those guys that buy or get the land rights, indeed do they have more access to credit? And do they invest in it? That's the question. Survey based. Uh, why is it interesting? Because there was a lot of regional variation. Some regions, when the land reforms were enacted in the 2000s, were very liberal and very early started to privatize the land, sell the land to the companies. Some other regions made it almost impossible by making the price very high. So inside Russia, you have variation because of some policy reasons. Um, I'm not going to go into all the complexities of the paper, right? like industrial, instrumental variables, solving the energy problem. It's just trying to get across the idea. But if you want to talk about this, 
and the full presentation of all the robust research and all that. And I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so we did a, a survey. Uh, in the end, we only kept 360 firms. Uh, they're all big firms, five test courses. Uh, and we asked them all kinds of questions. But the most important question, one important question is about do you have problems getting credit? And uh, what is your investment intensity? Uh, and the most important question was about the pain. So you asked them the land your company is on, your, your main factory is on. Is it privately owned? And when did you buy it? Is it a lease? Or is it a perpetual use right? Which is the song of money. Which still remains today in some cases. And basically then we're going to look. This, this is the, the basic question is just explaining this. By this. Controlling for a whole lot of other shit. Can we explain ads to good and investment by the tenure status of your life? Controlling for all the other things you can uh, uh, think of and trying to exogenize everything and so And the answer is yes. Huh? Let's get this, let's get this. Okay, this, this is the question we ask just to make sure does it make actually sense? Is it tractable? This is also a good thing if you do service. Be critical of yourself. And in the survey, you could put some questions to make sure, okay, am I on something here or is it just uh, I imagine something? So you ask people how, do, how often do banks, which is companies, how do banks require you to pledge levels for that one? And you see that the majority did. So it was like a sanity check, right? It's a sanity check. It was basically saying, ah, oh, it actually matters so much that the companies could help them because the banks ask for it. Okay. And then, okay, let's get this in the interest of time. And this is basically it. This is the regression. So, A would be either S to credit or investment. You have a whole lot of controls. I described it. The controls could be uh, how many employees, how long have you been privatized, the city size, all the plot characteristics you can uh, find, all the substructure, like if you own your other bank, privately owned, foreign owned, in the industrial group, uh, uh, profitability, also the, the growth in nodes in the regions, economic liberalization, corruption in the region, all, in, in, all the, the, the the, the kitchen sink of controls, we all do, right? We throw it in, and basically what we find essentially is this. So here the dependent variable is getting access to credit. And you see that if you have granted tenure status, uh, it's, it's what it's, the question is, is getting access to credit a problem? Right? And if you have private tenure, you see it's a lot less of a problem. And the effect is economically sizable, actually. If you have a lease, it's kind of in between. If you have perpetual use, it's much more a problem. So you see very clearly that having the private land and buying it uh, really reduces your problem with access to credit. That's exactly the sort of fact, the collateral fact. And we do all kinds of side quests to test it's really causal, uh, but this is like the first question. And the second one is that, okay, investment, do they invest more? Yes, if you have private land, not only you get more stability, you use the credit to invest. So, so it's, it's not that you have the credit to buy the plots, basically. <laughs> you could say, okay, there's more credit, I'm on private property, what they do, they get the credit and buy the land. No, no, they invest in the company, they first buy the land, then they get the credit, then they invest in the company itself. Quickly, uh, it's kind of simple to answer the company that owns land. Yeah, the single the single the bank. Uh, yeah. Could you make uh, kind of simple to the bank out? No, it's just not. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could you make kind of simple to the bank that the company has its own private land, private property, and then the this last name is the company. Ah, but that's, a, that's, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. But the profitability is one of the controls. So, so actually, we have here the list of all controls, and you see where is it profitability? Well, it's, it's, it's somewhere in there. Yeah. No, no, it's in the middle. Yeah. So, so, so we do control in some of the things for for profitability. But it's a, that's a, that's a very fair question, and that's a question also about actually. So, same same for is is it maybe endogenous in, uh, to the region and that instrument of time or something like that. But yeah, there's many questions about this question. And so half of the paper is addressing all these questions. Uh, 
And then these crashes were approved by Sebastian here. And so, so we were very happy to get them. And we also showed that then they invest more. So basically, essentially, the conclusion of the paper, so I, 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 skipped, I skipped all the other stuff because I wanted to talk about one last thing. Yeah. Uh, Russia introduced land that's printed late. Uh, those are little firms that buy the land, get much to build, and those guys also invest in it. And we, I think we proved in the paper, or at least we find indication in the paper, that it's a causal story. It's one really good one. Uh, so basically, uh, what, what we find is it's the first paper of the Mokri chapter in the Lesotho Revolution. Because Lesotho made this book very influential, and then we test it in early land, we test it in agricultural land in Africa, and it fails everywhere. <laughs> basically. Uh, and our idea was the reason is there's no banking. You cannot accept it to work if there's no modern access to banking. <laughs> so let's test it in a, in a place where there is banking. And the, Russia was our first idea. And there you see it's there. Right? Our second idea was Flanders. Ah, this is the title slide of a minute ago. Yeah? Because in Flanders, so what is nice about Flanders? Uh, so forget about the slide because I'm running out of time slowly, right? So, so what is nice about Flanders is, okay, in the 18, early 1800s, actually late 1700s, we had an invasion from Napoleon. Uh, we had kind of land rights. Formal, informal, scattered in that community like this, in that part of France like this, with very different types of land rights, not homogenous. So there was a system, but it was not a very good one, and not a very homogenous one. But Napoleon does, he rolls over the country. At the moment he uh, gets out, he has installed the civil code, the code civil, and he has installed the cadastre, a ledger. And the cadastre is still the one we have today. On brick is the same, it didn't change. So he started the measurements and we still have that cadastre. So he installed the system of being formal property rights. Since 1830, uh, they also valued all the land. So basically, we have a data set from the early 1830s. And also, we have again in 1846, I will tell you why in the US, uh, of the value of land per community. So you have more than 1,000 communities, villages basically, and you have the value of land in this community. <coughs> and, and it's land that is homogeneously uh, property rights. It's one system, a very simple homogeneous system. And then later on, in the 1860s, the government says, sorry, the government says at some point, okay. We have to develop the country. Let's create a bank. And the government created a state bank. It's called the Aizal uh, Khan. A state bank. But the interesting one is how did they do it? Initially, they said, okay, we can only build branches and uh, let's use the postal offices. And the postal offices were not necessarily the city centers because uh, the province was very, very agricultural, rural at the time. So it was just, if you have a map, just at regular places, they had uh, a post office to try to minimize the total distance. So not every community had one, actually. And they, they tried to do it in such a way that you can reach everyone in the shortest possible place time. So, and then these postal offices, uh, they have installed banks. So what you have, you have uniform property rights and the value of the land. And you have, in some places, all at once a bank. And what you basically say is, look, normally we expect that industrialization happens, controlling for everything else, where the cost of land is cheap. Because that's an input. You have to build a factory on some land. So you go where the land is cheap. Like Elon Musk is setting his big factory in Nepal, right? Uh, not in New York. You go where the land is cheap. Uh, but if you believe in Soto, it's the other way around. If you believe in Soto, the land is the collateral. So how can I start a business? I can start a business if I have very valuable agricultural land and have a bank. Because then I will use the land to pledge to the bank and we'll have a credit. And that's how I start the business. So if you have opposing predictions, normally people would say you have an dissertation where the land is cheap, and that's what we see in the in Soto we imply, no, no. You can see the dissertation where the land is expensive and you have value. And this is what we do in the paper. That's what we test basically. So this is uh, Flanders how it was. <coughs> until very late, this is what it became. Very early industrialization. And this is why. So the main dependent variable is going to be, so we have a census by a village, basically, uh, of the employment in trade and manufacturing 
at a village level. And we would take that as a measure of industrialization. Because in the 1800s, there was only like a proto industry. There were no, not a single industrial enterprise. So employment and trade and manufacturing was a very homogenous in all these villages. I was about 6 7%. But by 1910, you have very big differences. Some regions really stayed behind, and some regions really carried the industrialization. And the question is why? Right? The question is why. We control for logical things. We control for the waterways. So for every village, we have whether it's one to one of the navigable waterways. Because if you want to develop the list, you have to have transport. We also control for the railways. So we have not the whole railway system at that point in time. And we also control for if you have access to a rail. And also uh, tramways, local railways, that now have disappeared, but were a big thing. And skip this, skip this. So we had a system. I was talking talking about this. We had a system. So there was a kind of there was a kind of uh, measure in some places, but it was not homogenous. It was and so if you had it in one region, you could not transfer to the other region. Uh, then from the one region, not accepted in the other region. So it was a an heterogeneous system. But this is very old in France. Le so ledgers actually go back very far in France. Uh, and the main independent variable, uh, the main independent variable is the average price for land, which was very different across places, and not always linked to be close to the city. It was for its own reasons. And, now, and, and, and then there was the bank, right? So it's, you install this bank with the post office. This is the bank today. Actually, today uh, it has become, uh, so as a car was bought by Fortis. And Fortis then uh, went uh, bankrupt in the big press of 2008, and now it's actually the MP Argon. <laughs> but it's still a huh? So, uh, just so it's two tables, and then I'll stop and uh, leave some more time for questions. So, what is the regression? It's a very, very simplistic. But of course, we do many more things for business in that paper. Huh? Uh, so, basically, we say the industrialization of the village in 1910 should be a function of the land price early on in 1846, the presence of banks in 1860, 1860, and the interaction. So basically people would expect alpha 1 is negative, if the price is higher, we would, uh, uh, we would invest less. We say no, it should be positive. The alpha 2 should be positive, if you have more banking in early development, you should have more industrialization. And alpha 3 should be positive. It's especially the the presence of valuable land, if you have banks, that matters, because then you can pledge it. So we are, going, we are mainly interested in the alpha tree. Is it the joint presence of valuable land and this similar exogenous banking that does the trick of the trick of industrialization? Yes? That's what we do. <laughs> so this is the uh, it's not very visible. Okay, John, this one for you. I'm sure you can't read this slide, but <laughs> So John will point out, you didn't have to say this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But so this is the this is the uh, this is the interaction effect. So when you see uh, the price of uh, land in the locality is positive, banking is kind of mixed, but the interaction, that's what drives the results. It's especially if you have the presence of banking and a high land price, that is more distortion. That's what we find. The last thing we do is say, it, yes, but of course, we should do that economic development in a special way. I mean, say spatial, like spatial economic, it's not special, but spatial way. Uh, so the fact that I industrialized may depend on the fact that my neighbor industrialized. Obviously, my still is. So let's do a spatial regression. That's the one here. So it's the same as before, I only have this slope. And this is a spatial lagging like term. So basically, what it does, it allows that my industrialization depends on the disposition of my neighbors. And the little u is like a spatial weighting uh, uh, matrix. So it allows for spatial disturbance. And even if you do this, it doesn't matter. You find that the disturbation happens in those places, not where the land price is high or low. This is not very important, very small fact. Not financial development. It's actually completely significant. Once you control for the spatial aspect. It's points out the land, the high land prices, and financial development. Then it's, that's the, the most that happens. We control for the uh, uh, the value of houses to do that demand and for all the other stuff. So basically, and then this is done by my presentation also. Uh, uh, I believe land rights matter. I, it's hard to show, but I think you, you can prove they matter. Huh? 
Uh, and also in Flanders, I think that part of the industrial development in Flanders, which is a sort of historical mystery made by Leroy II, is partly due to this, partly due to the Minnesota Act, and a decision of the government to install modern banking in a place where we just by accident got modern methods, thanks to Napoleon. And in this kind of historical accident, in a way, made sure we understand the past. And that's not one explanation, obviously, but that's a big part of the explanation in my all right, so uh, we have ten, uh, uh, two, two minutes for uh, questions. Uh, would you like to interrupt me anytime? Okay. So, okay. How are you? Any questions? Yes. Very good question. Uh, it's understood well that the Minnesota effect is strictly related to the Berlin Shock Bank. Yes. But, uh, <clears throat> Uh, considering the example you gave us, uh, uh, there is a, an element in between the very beginning of your presentation which is about the enforcement of rules. And then uh, somehow you didn't uh, went to, uh, in my view, this uh, what you present about Flanders uh, is really also related to the uh, way in which uh, in this country there is a, a legal system which is working. And my question was uh, if uh, you could, for instance, have uh, differences in the different, uh, uh, in the different uh, ownership. For instance, in Russia, you have uh, that sort of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if somehow this trust uh, between uh, the way in which you can uh, have uh, property rights and the way in which you spend the property rights uh, in a bank is really related to the presence of a somehow strong legal system and the enforcement of the protection of the property rights. Yes, 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 absolutely. So you're totally right. I, I, as I said in the beginning, I assume that, that at the all that it's very important. But for Russia, what we've done, we've done some of the questions, not at the paper though, it's like a follow-up paper, uh, which we should publish at some point. Uh, we, we split the regions and like the good institutional regions and the bad ones in Russia. And we see, as a matter of fact, we see even the same data that in fact it's only, it's actually twice as big in the good regions, and the bad regions in fact reverses. So the interesting thing, is, let me tell you a story. The nice thing is, in Russia, if you get a title on your land, if you are in a bad region, in a region where governments can just grab you, where you have this rangers stuff, as I call it, what is actually happening is you get more problems. Because now you have something to grab, a long title. So you're totally right. You're totally right. So uh, I didn't talk about this, but I talked about it at the beginning. Of course, uh, I'm assuming here proper enforcement and judicial systems. And in Russia, that's part of the problem. So I'm, basically, what we say is on average, it worked in Russia. But if you look at the details, it's very clear it worked mainly in the good institutional regions, in good legal enforcement regions, and not in the bad ones. In the bad ones, it actually works in the reverse. So if you create a title in the favela, but uh, the manifesto rules, the party rules simply take the titles, right? <laughs> and then it's not problem. You, you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, you specific. Okay. Uh, I'm just interested in the area of concerning Russia. <coughs> so, um, the fact is that for Russia, there is some specifics that some companies have known for assets, for example, like tourist places or sports centers. Yes, so yes, for yes, the so that you Maybe uh, you have a lot of maybe interested uh, in some way. So do the type of assets also influences the um, access to credit, or maybe it's just so do the, just the fact of having any assets influences the uh, access to credit or maybe no. So 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 that's a very good question. Thank you, especially for Russia. So what we do, we have information about all their assets and use it as control. But the, the thing we regress on uh, is, so we ask them, what is the, the plot of your primary production facility? Uh, and that's the one we use in the getting access to credit. And this we show it works for if you have property of your primary plot, what well, your primary production facility plot. Uh, we did not actually test whether having uh, a holiday house in North Francisco on the Black Sea, or maybe in Crimea, or some other stuff, uh, uh, could also have to get access to credit. Or, I mean, many, many of these uh, companies do also like district, district heating and stuff like that, right? So, we didn't test it. That's a very good question. 
think that's not even free to do so. Yes. No. So one thing none of this literature discusses, but I found is actually the majority problem in the agriculture around the poor countries of the world is the law itself is bad. So sometimes giving enforceable legal property rights makes things worse. And what I mean by that is, for example, in the Philippines, the vast majority of land given in land reform forbids the recipient to sell, mortgage, lease it. So in fact, you have these corruption scandals where actually efficient farmers are illegally leasing the land from the guys who own. The guys who own it can't use it properly, but they're not allowed to sell or lease. So that's a case in which simply creating formal title and enforcing it makes it worse. Yes. Okay? So that's one. And that's almost, there's no papers on that. Yeah, that's very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. And then the second issue is the problem that the government has an incentive and rich people have incentive to have bad rules. So again, this, is, this I know in the Philippines, most cities even do not have cadastral surveys. And the government resists it. So why is that? So a very good example is Cebu, the second largest city in the Philippines. The actual title is paper. Yes. And very often the title of, will say where your land is located. Yeah. Many homes are located in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> that, is because, that is because there's one digit that's wrong yeah. on, the, on, the, on the property. Yeah. And then every time you buy or sell the land, an official annotates it to say that this is wrong. But you must annotate it each time. Yeah. They actually had a digital cadastral survey of Cebu, yeah. but the government will not allow merging the two. Yeah. And moreover, rich big companies, the oligarchs, want it to be inefficient because only they have are able to overcome the legal costs yeah. of dealing with this. So it's actually a barrier to entry for the smaller competitors yeah. to, to come up. Yeah. This is the kind of use, right? Uh, so, but it's the fault, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but so, so let me give you the example. On the first question, it's not the default, it's a choice question. So, so they create titles, but they're not full titles. They're often titles with, with limits. You, know, you get a title, but you can't sign it. Or, for, let me give you an example from Romania, that's a beautiful example. Uh, in Romania, when they privatized agriculture after the transition, what happened? Many of the Romanian farms were on coal holes or so forth. Uh, like commercial farms. The old farmers, in many cases, uh, were there. Some, some, like most were non present or in the country. So, what did they do? They basically did the following. So, uh, and Romania was a very big agricultural country and they had very concentrated industrialized agriculture. So, they had these big fields. Yeah. Let's say you have a field here and a field there. And they have all these workers. So, what they did is split every field equally. And so, and like this. No more than five meters. So if you can see it, if you drive down the Romania, you see it's like zebra fields. And then, and then like this. Instead of they might make a size of pots, they do like this. And a person A has something here and something here. And so the consequence was, and they also said you cannot sell it the first time yes. So what happened? People from cities that were descendants from Colpost people went back to the countryside to work in very efficient agriculture. All the old uh, economic assets, the tractors, the big agricultural machines, I mean, the thing was five meters. They couldn't even fit on, so they couldn't work the land. So they went back to park and horse and look at manual. The big animal houses, they privatized stone by stone. So around the countryside of the uh, main, you see these animal houses, stables, dilapidated, broken down because they have people just take the roof, take the stones, make their own stables. So this is a beautiful example of. Have the entitlement goes completely wrong uh, because you have you don't think about the, the main effect. The main effect is you should be able to sell it uh, and you should allow consolidation. Uh, uh, who, who can pledge this for the bank? Homeland wants because you can't sell it because uh, so so this is like that's what I said. Titles are not property. But to get property, you need the whole legal system, and this legal system that was your second point isn't very endogenous. The legal system is the elite that decide the legal system. So if you have a whole traditional legal system that favorizes the elites, the land titles are not going to work. This is the same big problem in Argentina. They have private property. 
because all the tribes of the land tax on the land is in the hands of very small Indians. And they could stop the development. Of course, in that case, it's not going to get a lot of development, obviously. So, the, so these things are very hard. And many of these things depend on the growth of the systems. And I just found two examples where it's pretty clean, although Russia is not competing with them. Right? Uh, one, one last question? Uh, do I have time for last question? Because I don't want to. Yeah, you have time for one. Okay. So you have Gibbard uh, and you have Hartmann's. The one with the source. Yeah, I just have a simple question. So, no, no, no. no. <laughs> About Russian paper. And yes. Uh, how large are these firms that you use for the Is that uh, You know, because yes. you're talking about the Desoto effect, yeah. it really relates to. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a question Sebastian also asked. So he said you should not call it the Desoto effect. The firms are large. They are large industrial firms with at least 500 people. So they are large. Yeah, so they will be very different from small. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the, but the, but the, but the, main, the main reasoning of the sort of was, look, uh, land rights matter because you can use mass collateral. But I'm saying, what, why would it also be good for industrial enterprises? He, he, in his book, he talks about, of course, developments, but the underlying intellectual logic is, okay, it's collateral, and that's good. And he said, look, it applies uh, in, in Flanders and uh, agriculture, that's good in sort of work, but it also applies to industrial enterprises. So you can broaden the idea. And this would also apply in Africa. In Africa, you have, in Africa, case, no land that's for industrial firms, but that would really help them to industrialize if they would have the land. So, in that sense, I think it applies. Okay, my father. I think it up, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, in India, what is happening particularly? Similarly, in case of agriculture, for example, yes. the farmer who go uh, for a lease lay land. Now, the, when the owner leases out land, so there is uh, the, the farmer who leases uh, in land. So for them, there is no protection, particularly since there is no legal system. If I have taken lease in land, I can't, I won't be able to access the credit. So what basically we are working on now is that instead of uh, 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 shifting the property right to me, because I am just leased in land. So we are in fact planning to uh, increase the, uh, make the leases formally, like a contract. Uh, like for 10 years, 20 years, so that there will be impact on I will invest more on capital or I may invest, uh, I may increase the productivity. So, in case of India, what exactly we are working on the project? Or That's an insurance factor, right? Yeah, so uh, instead of transferring the right, okay, let us uh, bring some uh, legal framework in which will be helpful for leased in tenant to access the credit. So just uh, just have like 10 to 20 years. Yes, so, like, so you, you want you want to create a system of legal contracts yes, yes, yes. that allows you to have a official lease that long term to connect it to credits. Yeah. That's what I mean. that's what it's a proper system is. Yeah. Right? But you have to build it. Because the biggest problem is that when the property rights comes, even uh, like if you're you are the landowner, yeah. you get scared because in future your land might go on my name. That is something which is fear in particular agriculture marketing. So it's good. I mean, uh, would you say something like, uh, do you give any example of country where this is happening? Like, that they are just in increase the uh, uh, lease in making it formal, kind of? Uh, it, it, it's, it happens in all African countries. And so it has been very successful so much. So, for example, there's a nice paper on Madagascar that shows that in Madagascar there is something like this, a formalization, and they, they show there it didn't quite work because. Two things. Because first of all, the formalization was fairly expensive and it uh, exceeded the cost. So you have to make sure that this is a transaction costing, but many of these people, even small expenses are too much. And secondly, because Madagascar is of course an island, and everybody knows everybody, the inform system didn't work for credit, but for, for realizability, for selling it, it worked quite well. So people, in fact, had a ledger in their heads and they kept track of all the transactions. So, so the the informal system worked relatively well, not for the sort of part, but for the reliability part. And that's why there the officialization fails. So I would advise people, if you want to create a property rights system, listen to the people and start, th think about what ISIS did and Al-Qaeda. Start with officializing what is there. People have a system. It doesn't work at all, but they have a system of rights. They know this land is yours, this land is yours, and they have user front rights. And the first thing is to officialize the system that exists, that people will accept it. And from there on, you can build the contracts, the collateral structure, the property rights. But first, listen to the people. In many cases, these 
if things go wrong, because some foreign advisor like me comes and says, you should do this and this and this and this. If I pay for my contacts, well, the contacts never come to Britain. They never come to Britain. So, these, so, so we, we think that these systems are uniform. That's very wrong. So, so I do a lot of these uh, projects in real profit investment. And you see that in Belgium, as compared to France, or the UK, or Germany, the system of how you can pledge land, how the rights are distributed, what happens in the election, are very different. People think it's homogenous. No, it's country specific. And it's often driven by history. And there's, you can, of course, have like a general picture of it, but the details are very different. So I would say, listen to the people, look at the system that's there, try to officialize that stuff. You can accept it and then it. Stuff in there. Not do it like, like a foreign body, because then. Okay, thank you. Now it's time to talk to break, and uh, we are waiting to hear back in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.